um, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm Joey Lai, I'm Advanced Genomics Specialist at uh, the Westmead Genomics Facility at Wimmer. And today we have uh, James Miller from Pacific Biosciences and Paul Gooding from Millennium Sciences to tell us about uh, their long read sequencing technology with PacBio. Uh, before we get started, I apologize. I uh, mentioned this last week, but I, I'll um, do a bit of a promotion again about some uh, uh, recent technologies that we've acquired at our facility. Um, it's just to share uh, with you. So uh, this has been made possible through our collaboration with uh, Professor John Idell and um, a pro sorry, a Associate Professor Ruby Lin uh, via the Farge Australia program and with AGRF as well. So if I share my screen, just quickly share. Okay, so the first instrument that we just got maybe about uh, six months ago now um, is a iSeq Illumina uh, short read sequencer. So the key applications for this is for targeted sequencing, uh, bacterial whole genome sequencing, and viral whole genome sequencing. So any kind of small genome uh, sequencing work. Um, it generates 1.2 gigabytes of output. Uh, of output. Uh, the number of reads per run is 4 million reads, and the max read length is 150 base pair per end. So this is the baby of the family in terms of their Luminous platforms. Sorry, Joey, I think we're seeing your second slide rather than your first slide there. That's a bit odd. Oh, am I not sharing the right one? Okay. So I'm seeing your uh, in-house capabilities slide. Sorry, okay, let me stop share and then <laughs> I'll um, re-share and maybe choose the right screen. Um, okay. Yeah, that's much better. Better. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, so <laughs> that's good. Said, otherwise, you're pointed to things on the screen that were just not making sense. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yep. So that was the iSeq. Uh, the next instrument that we got was uh, the MGI DNB Seq. So that's another short read sequencer. Um, and the application. This is a higher output pl platform. If you're familiar with the Illumina platforms, it's the equivalent to say a, Novus, a NovaSeq SP uh, kind of uh, run. So the key applications for this is whole genome sequencing. You can do human and microbial uh, targeted sequencing panels, such as exomes as well, uh, as well as RNA-seq. Uh, the outputs are 150 gigs of uh, uh, gigabases. Uh, 100 or 500 million reads per run or, and a uh, max read length of 150 base pair penned in. So this is, um, uh, I guess, supported as well um, with AGRF. And the last thing I'll just briefly touch on is this um, highly multiplex spatial transcriptomic assay, which is called the Visium assay. So this is a... Um, uh, available an assay that's available through 10x genomics um, and it allows you to spatially resolve mRNA expression in FFPE and fresh frozen tissue. Uh, so for the FFPE assay we can analyze you know pretty much whole transcriptomes so but they do have a panel of probes that targets 18,000 genes or 20,000 mouse genes and for fresh frozen tissue um, we the, the assay is applicable for a wide range of species. So what you can get out of it is the characterization and mapping of uh, cell populations within the tissue uh, spatial context. So we've developed this as an in-house uh, service, uh, a workflow in-house that's available as a service. So this is the first in New South Wales that you know, I am aware of, and so I've been told by 10X. So, um, what this involves is the you can provide your block. Our biobank team will extract the RNA for QC. The block will then be provided to our histology team, uh, who can do the sectioning and place it on these uh, the capture slides, uh, capture regions on the Visium slide. 
So there's four capture regions per slide that you can do this on. We then uh, image it on um, a confocal microscope, I believe, and then it's, you can do H&E or immunofluorescence. Then I would take it over from there to do library preparation um, in situ on the slide. And then the libraries are sent uh, to AGRF for sequencing and our bioinformatician, Brian, can um, do the analysis and you know, get um, the spatial mapping of your gene expression profiles. And I won't go through our other technologies, but this is just a plug for you know, some of the other things we do. We'd, um, so if you have any kind of requests or any ideas that you want to discuss for your projects, uh, please, you can contact me. So with that, I'll end there, and then I can pass over to uh, James for the PacBio talk. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Joey. Um, I'll just put my screen up. Okay. So I'm just going to give a, a, a quick intro to PacBio before um, Paul talks um, talks about the starts talking about the applications uh, just as a quick intro I did this last week as well so I'll go over it relatively quickly um, so earlier this year many of you might have noticed that um, our pack bio logo changed and we upgrade up, updated our branding um, and this sort of really re reflects the fact that pack bio has um, has changed a lot as a company over the last couple of years and it's driven um, largely by our uh, highly accurate sequencing technology, Hi-Fi Reads, which is uh, everything that PacBio Long Read technology does now. And so our mission uh, now is to enable the promise of genomics to better human health and uh, all of the applications that we support are driving towards that, that goal. Um, we now have uh, six global locations. Uh, we've, got, we've, we've doubled in size as a com company in the last couple of years. We now have seven, more than 700 employees globally. Uh, my role as regional commercial lead for ANZ is a, is a, is a new one as well, uh, and I cover Australia and New Zealand and support our distributor partner, Millennium Sites. <clears throat> um, over the last 12 months, really, there's been a lot of transformation in, in, in PacBio. Uh, we've formed some really important partnerships with uh, Invite and, uh, and Twist. Um, new product development, new, new kitted end, end solutions have come out, and I'll be talking about some of those in the, uh, after poll. Uh, and you may have noticed that we've um, made a couple of acquisitions. Omniome, a short read, uh, highly accurate sequencing technology that you'll hear more about early next year, as well as Circulomics upfront um, sample prep uh, technology, which is now uh, comes under the PacBio umbrella. Uh, we've got a number of uh, key big collaborations, uh, a couple of which, for example, is, is with the Broad, who have actually just purchased, I think, another 15 um, uh, SQL2 systems. Uh, about a month ago uh, and, and Google Health. And we're bringing out new capabilities on our system, uh, including on instrument 5MC detection, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later on as well. Uh, so with that, the agenda for today is, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Paul. He's going to talk a bit, of, he's gonna introduce what HiFi is uh, uh, in, a, in a bit of a summary. Uh, and then we'll jump into human genomics applications for HiFi sequencing. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Paul, to uh, start the, uh, the discussion about high fi Thanks, James, and, and thanks, Joey. It's um, interesting when you saw Joey's presentation, actually, that um, happens that Millennium Science distribute uh, 10X Genomics products as well as, as PacBio. So it was uh, good to see his plug there anyway. So I will share my screen and, um, as we said, talk a little bit about uh, how high fi works and then some of the applications we have, certainly in the in the human space. All right, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so yeah, um, I did give this sort of overview uh, last week. So this is a slightly cut down version of it so that um, people who saw it will probably recognize some of it, but we won't uh, dwell on it too long. So um, PacBio, this is the beast. This is the SQL 2E system, their latest um, 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 model instrument um, launched reasonably recently. 
Um, the advantage, I guess, it has over the SQL 2 system is it does a lot of the on-instrument data processing, um, and uh, that really does speed up things. It's, it's doing processing in real time while it's sequencing, and, and you'll hear a little bit about this real-time smart sequencing, as it's called, a single molecule real-time sequencing. So um, not only is it sequencing, it's also um, getting on with the um, analysis in, in that time. So it cuts down enormously on the analysis time. Um, it's cloud enabled, so the storage and stuff is is um, is really um, compact and easy to use. And um, as a result of the, the 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 faster data processing, the fact that your 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 data is so long and accurate, uh, and you're able to um, um, make these assemblies and things, the the, the compute cost saving is, is is huge and estimated in US dollars there at about seven hundred dollars saving per human genome um, over the previous system, which is um, great. So um, just moving on to a little bit of, of this um, on the machine um, is a smart cell. I said about the smart thing, the single molecule uh, real time sequencing. So it's got 8 million little holes in this chip and uh, your DNA is being sequenced in a polymerase complex at the bottom of the well. And uh, it's important you've got fluorescent nucleotides floating around. Um, but they don't get um, analyzed um, uh, because uh, the light is only able to penetrate the very, very bottom of the, of the well where the polymerase is, is, is uh, pulled down and bound. So you only uh, see the flash of light effectively from the fluorophore that's being incorporated into the molecule. Okay, and the, the analogy is like your microwave door. It's got that mesh on the front and uh, the microwave can't come through that mesh because of the, the size uh, the, um, of, of, of the microwave, the, the wavelength of the microwave, it won't go through. It's the same with the wavelength of the light. It only just penetrates the bottom of the well so that only illuminates the bit going through the polymerase. So there we go. Um, and uh, yeah, just in a little bit more detail of how it works, I'll just play this little animation here. If you like, um, the, the bases are, are being incorporated. There's a flash of light, you, you actually cleave off the fluorophore. Um, but you can see there's a cadence to the way that those bases are incorporated. So you see a flash of light, then there's a gap, another flash, and that's the, the rate that the polymerase is incorporating the bases. Um, and that cadence can be measured, and, and James might touch on this, um, because when there's a methylated base, there's a slight change in that cadence. It's a slight stall of the polymerase while it thinks about that methylated site. Um, and, and that slight change in timing um, allows the, the software to call um, methylated bases as well. So um, that's kind of how it all works. And you can imagine um, um, on each of these, these um, uh, zero mode waveguides, MWs as they're called, the little holes in the cell, you're getting a read as, as things cycle through and you're doing this all in parallel across the 8 million wells on, on, on the smart cell. So that's kind of how it works. And of course your big advantages here as we've touched on is this is long read sequencing. So, um, uh, you know, up, up to 50,000 base pair inserts more commonly these days for the very, very high accurate sequencing that we want. Um, looking at around about 20 KB or so, maybe a little bit bigger, but um, 20 KB or so is, is optimal. Um, and then I'll show you why in a moment, but um, the, the reads are also not just long, but very, very highly accurate. It's arguably the, the well, is the most accurate um, sequencing system on the market at the moment with Q50 type scores. That's 99.999% accuracy um, on this consensus sequencing, which we'll explain in a sec. As say, single molecule rec um, resolution. So each molecule is going into the, into the smart cell and being sequenced in, in real time. There's no um, amplification no, no uh, PCR steps. So you're sequencing the molecules that you've taken straight from your organism or sample, uh, and that's important. There's very uniform coverage as well because of the way the polymerase works. Um, it, it, you don't have these problems getting through homopolymers or through very GC rich regions, for example. Um, it, it sequences um, uh, with, with the least bias, again, the, of, of, um, of the technologies available. And as James might mention later, um, there's also um, free of charge, all built in epigenetic detection. So it's it's, it's finding its 5MC um, calls as well. So you start with a piece of double-stranded DNA um, for sequencing. This might be a shared piece of DNA from um, an organism. Uh, it could be an amplicon, um, something you, you PCR amplified. It could be a piece of cDNA that you've taken from RNA. It could be whatever, as long as you can get a double-stranded uh, molecule. You will um, ligate on these little adapters, so called smart bell adapters. And you make a topologically circular molecule. Okay, you bind a sequencing primer and, and uh, or anneal, I suppose, uh, a sequencing primer and bind the polymerase to make this complex. And, and uh, 
this then starts the, the sequencing engine, if you like, um, and it goes into this kind of rolling circle um, mechanism, which um, viruses love, and which DNA is the, really the most stable um, form for, for DNA um, for replication and things. So what you do is, is this chugs around a bit like a, a chain of a bicycle um, uh, going going through the polymerase. Um, you sequence effectively the, the both the positive and negative strands. So as you can see here, you're, you're sequencing through the purple strand, then you see an adapter, then you go through the, the yellow, the, the, the negative strand, if you like, and then you see an adapter and then the positive and then the negative and round and round you go. And because you've got such long read sequencing here, um, a 20 kb molecule goes around multiple, multiple times. And you form this consensus. And this is what the machine is doing in real time when it's processing data. Um, if there are some random polymerase errors, and there will be because polymerases do by nature make random errors um, every now and then, um, you, you can basically take them out of your data set because you're calling a consensus because you've gone round and round the molecule so many times. Here you might see a T, but underneath all these other reads, you get a G. So it's clear that this is just a, an error and you've got the, the real call is G. So you make this, this hi-fi read, this consensus read, it's a hi-fi is the term that, that, that PacBio used. And because of that accuracy uh, of, of the consensus, you, you can call way, way greater than 99.5% accuracy on up to 25 KB molecules. So this is um, fantastic accuracy, amazing coverage, gives you the ability to have very, very complete genomes, which is really, really important. We don't want to miss biological information, do we? We want completeness in our genomes, absolutely. And I'll talk about that in a second too, probably. Um, so accurate, of course, that you can phase um, um, your genomes. So you've got a copy of your uh, from mum and from dad, if you like, in a, in a diploid organism. And, and because of the small changes um, and it's so accurate and you've got it over such a long distance, you can phase those. And it's particularly important for some of these um, uh, particular things like plant genomes that um, you've got, um, you know, things like wheat where you've, you've got multiple genome copies and uh, they're hexaploid, they're polyploid organisms. And uh, you're able to, identify the different genome complements in those and, and phase them and, um, and form pan genomes. We might talk about that too. Um, and it's just fantastic for calling all the variants that you can see in the genome, whether that's um, uh, SNPs and uh, single nucleotide variants as small and uh, indels uh, up to very large structural variants. And that's really important, particularly with um, um, uh, trying to find the cause of rare inherited diseases. So let's get into the main thing now and, and talk about whole genome sequencing applications here that um, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll start wide, we'll start quite broad and, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll sort of uh, uh, zoom in a little bit and talk um, particularly about that human stuff at, at the end. But um, PatBio is being used now very routinely for, for, for sequencing of, of very high quality um, plant and animal genomes from all over the place. In fact, um, you know, you're seeing publications, you know, every week um, coming out with, um, with, with a new piece of information um, uh, about a, uh, another genome that's been sequenced, which um, is fantastic to see. And, and, and just some, some examples there from the, from the, the covers of, of, um, of journals. Um, there was a special um, uh, uh, journal from um, Nature um, in, in 2021 where they um, concentrated uh, entirely on, on, um, on vertebrate genomes um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the contribution that PacBio had made to, to those was, was, was extraordinary and um, so many um, really, really accurate, well um, assembled genomes because of this very long and highly accurate sequencing. Um, there's challenges, of course, with plant and animal genomes. Well, there's challenges in all genomes, but um, but particularly in 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 some of these um, plant and animal genomes, it's being found now, of course, that um, the genome size can can be vast, and and particularly in some plants. Um, uh, you're, you're looking at, um, at, at genomes much, much bigger than human, for example. Uh, and this becomes challenging. And uh, as I said, you've got polyploidy uh, going on as well. Um, and, uh, and it makes it very challenging to sequence. And, and short reads just, just can't cut it because there's not enough uh, variation. Uh, or you, you can't align the smaller sequence because you don't see enough variation in each of the small reads to be confident about stitching those together. I guess the example is, is here, um, uh, really that difference um, 
you're, you're going to get gaps or, or you're going to mismap if you've got, you're in repeat regions, for example, you can't be sure off a short read where it fits in, in a repeat and, and uh, it's very, very difficult to find um, the ends of those repeats and, and confidently um, stitch everything together. But when you've got much longer reads that are really accurate, then you're able to, um, to, to, to make those assemblies much, much more easily and, and it saves a massive amount of compute time, um, which is also really, really important. So. Um, it, 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 bigger really is better, as it says on the on the slide here. When it when it comes to um, assembly, um, if you've got something like a you know an, in, an inserted um, piece of DNA, like a transposable element, um, you, you need to be able to sequence through um, and know um, where those ends are, and, and be able to, to to stitch these various contigs together, if you like, and and uh, to make one larger contig. And uh, and on the right here, as as I discussed very briefly before, um, that that accuracy also helps phase um, uh, um, uh, the genomes, and uh, and, and uh, that that can be really really important when we're looking at, at pan genomes, which we'll we'll talk about in a sec. So these, I suppose, are the, the real take homes of, of the advantage that you have from 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 highly accurate long read sequencing from from PacBio on their SQL two e. Um, You've got very high contig scores. Um, so you get uh, really, really amazing completeness of those genomes. So no missing bases. You're not missing any biological information. You get it all. Um, the accuracy, of course, gives you really high correctness. And because you've got such long pieces of DNA that are essentially dead right in their sequence, it match, means the compute of stitching this together is, is much, much easier. So um, you gain on compute time as well. So it's the so-called four Cs that, um, that, that Pat Bayer like to talk about um, uh, for, for contiguity, completeness, correctness, and, and the compute time. So um, worth remembering those. Now, well, just a brief summary of, of, of variants that you can get in a, in a genome. And uh, we've mentioned a couple of these already. You've obviously got SNPs um, or single nucleotide variation. Um, and uh, yeah, example here, obviously you need um, uh, very accurate sequencing for this. The length is perhaps not so critical here, but um, um, but you need to have accuracy. If, you're, if your reads are noisy, it's very, very difficult to confidently call a SNP or a, a single nucleotide variant. So accuracy is very, very important not just the read length okay when it comes to small deletions or insertions in DELs um, again the longer reads are helpful depending on the size of the deletion or insertion uh, you can read through them with confidence and get out to the uh, either end and still map things back um, then it starts to get more and more difficult when you start getting little tandem duplications or interspersed duplications or um, inversions you know again depending on the complexity of this and the size you need the long reads and the accuracy to get this all together translocations as well if something's just moved somewhere else copied somewhere else uh, um, you, you, again depending on the size of these of, of these pieces you, you need the long reads um, and then copy number variants of course um, so repeat expansions um, are, are a big thing in, in, in rare inherited diseases often um, and so to be able to accurately sequence those um, variants uh, and particularly with repeat expansions where, where you've got that, that sort of little footprint repeated many many times and the number of those repeats can be critical for, for a disease um, to show or not um, uh, then you need again that that accuracy. So before we get into humans, we'll just go through a few advantages. I'm a plant biologist by by training before um, um, when I um, before I joined Millennium Science, and uh, so I still like to to talk about a, a few plant things to know that they haven't been completely forgotten about, nor should they be. Um, so this is um, a nice one, a, a, a publication that came out on on the rose genome. Um, and some details about that here. But as you can see, um, there was a, a reference genome that was done with short read sequencing from Illumina. And, um, you know, while they did a, a lot of coverage and threw a lot of resource at this, there was um, still quite a number of problems. And you can see there's regions where they just get so little coverage at all, where it goes very light. Um, and these are probably very difficult regions in the genome. You've probably got, again, these homopolymers or a lot of repeats or IGC content or something that's very, very difficult to, to get through. Um, but when uh, HiFi uh, was was thrown at it, you see again, you see this same structure. This is um, a, a, a difficult piece of, of DNA generally to, to be looking at, but they were able to sequence through and um, and uh, and even re resolve the the haplotypes. And it's a uh, rose is, is tetraploid, so um, a very high contig score and, uh, and and a very complete genome. 
but it's effective really for for, for anything um and uh, you know some examples just given here you've obviously got those small you know things like insects um you know with smaller genomes again the accuracy really counts um uh, and then you've got um some of those i suppose mid-sized genomes so uh, yeah but some some um you know, farm species um in agriculture and things like uh, like shown here again bigger genomes but uh, again you can get big context sizes i mean ultimately we're trying to aim for context the size of chromosomes right and uh but the ability to then phase those genomes particularly important for breeding programs and things like that um, to see where um, different parts of the DNA are coming from and, and mapping them back. And then you've got these monsters, of course, plants um, where they can have massive genomes. Um, and again, um, very, very difficult to, um, to sequence well with short reads and uh, you have to have massive, massive, massive amounts of coverage. But, um, but here, um, and we'll see an example in the plant a little bit later. Um, uh, again, very, very good context scores, um, but because of the length and accuracy, just assembly time is a joy. Um, you know, overnight you've assembled your genome. Absolutely amazing. So here's an example that was um, perfect for Pac Bio, I suppose. Um, uh, they're they're based in the Bay Area of San Francisco, um, so they 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 chose uh, one of their sort of uh, champion trees. They're the sequoia. Um, uh, a California redwood, um, and they took took needles and and uh, and extracted DNA and sequenced and and um, and they did this in in a, a matter of a few weeks, um, and uh, as you can see, there was um, a combination of of um, Oxford nanopore long reads um, and Illumina short reads that that had been done on sequoia, um, and uh, the assembled time took months and months. Um, and here, um, I think the, the whole process from going out into the, the campus um, and, and picking some needles um, took, took about two or three weeks to do the whole thing to um, assemble. Um, so uh, you can see really every level, the, the long read and highly accurate reads just sort of um, knock the, the noisier long reads in combination with short reads um, uh, away. Um, at really at every stage, um, the, um, the assembly size is better. The contig is much, much better. Um, the alignment to known um, um, genes and, and uh, um, the annotation is better. And uh, the assemble time is not not even in the same not in the same league. So um, yeah, that was a great piece of work. And just before we get into the human stuff, we're here we are in Australia. We've got to think about something a bit Australian. So um, there was some sequencing of uh, platypus um, genome here. Um, it's uh, an egg laying mammal, if you like, one of the monotremes. And uh, by by having a, a, a complete genome. Um, they found um, copies of this VTG um, gene um, that's known to be um, uh, linked to the egg laying um, um, phenotype in birds. Um, it doesn't exist um, in, uh, in, in other mammals, as you can see in human here, it doesn't, that doesn't exist, um, but, um, but good old platypus. As a, as a copy, so um, that that's, um, makes some suggestions about um, um, its anomalous or leg laying um, um, uh, way of life. So um, yeah, it's uh, just a, a little interesting example to flag up. So we'll move on to, I guess, what uh, a lot of you probably are interested in hearing about and, and applications for, for human genetics here. So we talk about the accuracy. We all know about the Human Genome Project um, and uh, when it has been going on for, for decades, really. And um, but just very recently, the so-called T to T, telomere to telomere um, complete human genome sequence was was published. Um, uh, and it, it's there, there was about, I think, 10 or 12 percent or something of the genome that, that had otherwise been um, too difficult to um, to, to accurately um, map and, and sequence. Um, but with the with the long reads and the accuracy from from pack bio or all those um, little dark regions in in the genome um, uh, have now been resolved and we've got um, uh, through from from telomere to telomere on each chromosome now which is, I think, an amazing, amazing effort. And um, yeah, I'm not going to read the slides to you, but um, yeah, it was 8%, eight, eight I was wrong, 8% of the genome that, that hadn't before been able to be sequenced. And, uh, and now um, they have that completeness. And as we say, the complete genomes are going to be important to answer everybody's biological questions because you can, you, there's no point probing a, an incomplete data set if you like, you don't know what you're missing, right? So it's important. 
So just moving on um, then into pan genomes, talked a little bit about this phasing of, of genomes um, and there's um, various consortia now around the world that are, are looking um, rather than just the, the human genome, some generic human genome um, is actually to start looking at um, a lot of different human genomes um, uh, from, from different parts of the world, different places and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and to be able to, to, to look at the similarities and differences um, between you know, different populations of humans and um, you know, that, that goes into to all sorts of things of, of mapping um, uh, the movement of, of humans around the globe and, and, and all of those sorts of um, things, as, as well as their susceptibility to certain diseases and, and, and that sort of thing. It's um, going to be um, information that's been found in the, in, in the pan genome. So uh, which way are we going here? Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's better. We're back to where we were. So yes, this has been published uh, um, uh, as part of the, the Human Pan Genome Reference um, um, Consortia. Um, uh, again, uh, they're looking at trios and, and things like this too. Um, so trios as mum, dad, and and um, an offspring to um, to look and 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 get this haplotized haplotype data. And um, at the moment, this is they're, they're leading with um, you know the, the the most haplotype data and um, the most complete um, separation of the camas of uh, these parental haplotypes. And um, and this this very much is ongoing. And uh, yeah, and there's a few little quotes in there from the papers that, um, that all high five based deployed assemblies have outperformed the haploid assemblies of, um, of their competition long read sequencing from, from ONT. Um, and there's there's more stats there, of course, where um, um, they're, they're able to um, show that the, the data is just such good quality. <clears throat> and uh, the, the technology itself was named as a, one of those top technologies to watch that um, the journals sometimes do. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's become a bit of a buzzword now for, for back by that it really is a game changing technology. And um, uh, it, the part of this, the T2T um, uh, sequence has, has led people to realize that the power that you've got in making complete genomes. And I think um, uh, going forward, um, that these, these partially assembled genomes are, are just not, not gonna be accepted now. People know that they can do better and they will. So into a bit of the rare and inherited disease stuff, um, uh, just a, a little graphic here um, uh, to, to talk about um, to talk about this. I think really the, um, the, the the phrase on the right there in the pink. Um, this is an American um, uh, uh, angle on it, but um, is estimated between 25 and 30 million um, Americans are living with a, a rare disease, and um, um, you know the, these the, these diseases affect about one in ten people globally, and um, about 80% are genetic in origin, and um, and, and well over 50% of those. Um, the case, uh, the reason is is just unknown, or or at least it has been up until very very recently, and uh, uh, it, it's been very very difficult to get handles with the, with the, um, the, the the preceding technologies, I guess, um, uh, of ways of screening, um, and the call was made really that just more complete genomes and and uh, accurate genomes are needed to in order to find these 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 rare inherited diseases. And this is an idea, I guess, of the, of the history of, 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 of screening. So you've got the, you've got the, the you know, the, the microscopy, the karyotype screaming, where they were looking, literally looking for abnormal chromosomes under, under the microscope and seeing if they could see anything obvious, you know, a twist or a missing arm of a chromosome, you know, a very large sort of scalping. thing. Um, but, you know, was, was, you know, partly successful. And it was, you know, with the technology that they've had going, uh, going back, it, it, it explained about 5% of, of a lot of these rare and head disease case then microarrays came along and of course you had a lot more power you could you could screen um uh, you see the up and down regulation of things and and uh, and look at copy number variants of, of large size and this then started to um to, to give you more um uh, more of these hits on on some of the problems so maybe up to about 10 percent solve rates on on these rare inherited cases and then, of course, short read sequencing came in um, both genome, full genome and, and exome. So um, looking just at the transcripts, oh, please don't keep changing on me. Um, 
and and the solve rates again were increasing 30 40 percent um but now with the long read sequencing and the ability to look at uh, accurately at either single nucleotide variants right up to large um, um uh, rearrangements or or, or uh, large structural variants uh, up to about two-thirds now that um are, are being solved um and we'll have some examples coming up i'll skip through because there's quite a lot of them but um uh, just just the, showing you the power here effectively that um, the, the, the accurate and long read gives you um, over short read. It's, it's able to um, be the best performers at finding these SNPs and finding indels and finding these large stru structural variants. And um, there's been um, publications and, and papers and, and uh, journal articles all over um, from different people um, showing this um, in detail. And it's been adopted by a lot of these leading um, uh, institutions from around the world. So we'll talk about some examples from Kansas City Children's Mercy. Um, James already mentioned the, the links with Invite um, and Broad, um, and, but also from, from, from all over really. Um, there's lots of places that are using PacBio by choice to, to look for these, um, these rearrangements and, and, and to try and find you know, reasons for, for these, these you know, diseases and, and perhaps find then some clinical treatments that, that are relative to, to, to those um, diseases. It's a big partnership too with Genomics England. It's not just in the US and there, there's partnerships so, uh, over in Asia now um, uh, where Pat Bio are working with, um, with the genome centres to, um, to look for these rare inherited diseases and, and map them and, and give, I guess, parents answers um, to, 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 to why their children have, have, these, um, have these issues. And, uh, and as I say, then building some clinical um, 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 knowledge on top of that to see if they can um, help these people. Um, and uh, even now, um, there's uh, probably 13% uh, or more of, of new explanations that, that uh, are coming along and, on, on these previously unsolved cases. And this number is actually climbing um, all the time. The more that, um, that these, these, um, these puzzles are looked at, the more solve rates that PacBio is being able to give. So we'll go into a few examples here, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll dwell maybe on the first couple, and then and then skip through a bit on the uh, uh, conscious of time. And uh, James and I both have a, um, a meeting after after this one, so we need to be on time. Um, but this one is from Stanford. Um, uh, there was a, it's quite a sad case of a, a 22 year old guy um, who was um, um, through 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 his life was having recurring heart tumors, so he was forever. Um, you know, feeling lethargic and sick, and and um, you know, just dreadful for his parents of going through his childhood, and then he'd have to have major surgery and have these um, tumors removed from inside his heart, and then um, you know he'd recover and he'd feel better, and then it would start to deteriorate again, and he'd have to have more surgery and more surgery, and um, you know, a really awful, debilitating thing for a for a young guy. Um, They'd been screening done with um, next gen short read sequencing, so um, and and they couldn't find a, a reason for this. Um, but when when Pat Bio was was thrown into the mix, um, they found a 2.2 kb deletion um, in this area of the of the genome, and um, and and showed that this was the re the reason for these um, these recurring tumors. So it was a, a solve uh, uh, that that hadn't otherwise been um, shown and. As I say, there's a lot of these, and we'll, we'll 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 pop through them, and just just to give examples of the different sorts of chromosome rearrangements that can be picked up. Um, so as I said, that was a 2.2 kb deletion. Okay, <clears throat> this one's an in, an insertion. So this was a a, a young female that had um, uh, yeah, seizures and 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 other intellectual disabilities, and and again. Uh, without going into too much detail, um, NGS couldn't find it because obviously the insertion was too big to find um, and and uh, a map back properly. Um, but with PacBio's um, long read, um, it was able to find um, the cause of, and, uh, and move forward. And that was from the Hudson Alpha Institute in Alabama, I believe. Um, third one, this is from um, a case in, in Japan, Yokohama City Uni. Again, uh, uh, a young child, young girl, um, intellectual disabilities, couldn't find the result, um, but then, uh, yeah, uh, managed to um, find this with, with phasing uh, of the genome and, uh, and, and find the, the, the issues there. And um, uh, yeah, it, it turned out that the, the allele, allele that, um, that, that was causing the problem here had come from mum, but it was a de novo inversion in the child and that wasn't inverted in, in mum. 
So um, yeah, that's uh, that, that was the, the problem that the, the poor child had was this inversion in that section there. And it was solved and uh, you'll see the quote there um, from the researchers, state-of-the-art technologies is advantageous to elucidating hitherto inaccessible genome changes, which is not easy to say in English, maybe it's easy to say in Japanese, I don't know. Um, another example, um, and uh, we'll skip through this, this is a, a so-called complex rearrangement, 17-year-old female um, with, with problems, obviously NGS couldn't find, um, but with PacBio again, uh, a complex rearrangement. You can see how this is um, uh, completely changed from the reference um, inversions and, and repeats and, and deletions and all sorts of things going on. So a real mess. No way that you can map this back with short reads because it, it, it's just no way of knowing how, how the arrangement has gone. Um, so um, long reads is the only way. It was a 13 meg complex rearrangement. So um, you absolutely need that long sequencing. So. Um, Again, another complex rearrangement here, um, again from Hudson Alpha Group, um, that was um, um, also in, in a paper that they published along with the one I described earlier, so I won't, I won't dwell on it, but again, look at the complexity of the rearrangement, there's just no way that you can find out what's going on unless you can sequence right through it, right? So. Um, repeat expansions, I mentioned that earlier, an example here from Kansas City. Um, uh, again, this repeat expansion, um, because you've got this repeat sequence going out loads and loads of times, you need to be able to sequence through it. It's um, um, a really strange um, GC um, percent um, when you've got 80, 80, 80, it's, it's essentially a 0% GC here and, um, and very difficult to, to be sequenced by other technologies, but that guy at bio could go through, find out this repeat expansion that was, re was um, causing the problems in, in this child. Uh, another one from, the, I think the last few are from, from Kansas City. Um, another issue here, um, again, managed to find um, these uh, um, mutations, but interestingly about this one, um, it was to do with the phasing that was able to solve it. Um, it was a compound heterozygote, so that there was um, a, a mutation on one allele here and another one on another allele here. So you need to be able to phase um, in order to, um, to find out about uh, that. You can't just sequence because you wouldn't know that one was on one, one chromosome, one was on the other. So you need that phasing to be able to do it. And um, uh, yeah, there's another example here, just um, really a, a simple way that hi fi was able to go through the part of the genome that was very, very difficult to sequence with other technologies. It's just one of those NG NGS dropouts. So whether that would be, again, strange GC retinas or homopolymer or, or, or something, just a dark region, those so-called dark regions in the genome that are difficult to get through. PacBi was able to get through. And so the technology is being used all over the place is a, a, a pediatric cancer research um, example here. Um, that, uh, um, yeah, uh, that, that, that's recently been published, um, um, looking at a rearrangement. Here again, you can see the complexity of the rearrangement. Um, uh, if you want the details, obviously you know, look at the paper, but um, there's just no way without long reads that you can get through with, with the complexity of, of what's going on. But one of the other things I just want to say is, of course, that when you're doing this genome sequencing, you're not just looking for the mutation and this is this this is um you're getting more bang for your buck than just using a, a particular screen for a, um for a, for a, a, um, a problem that somebody has when you've got the sequencing not only do you find the um the, the region of interest that's causing a particular um syndrome or illness or whatever um, you've got the so-called causative agent here and from the samples and, and its position, but you're getting all this other th uh, stuff as well. So, for example, if, if you're interested in cytochrome P450s and, and the way they may uh, metabolize different drugs and things like that, you've got that information built into your, what is your genome sequencing as well, which you're not, again, really getting from, from, from NGS. Okay, so you, you've got the, 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 all of the, 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 the sequence of all of these um, cytochrome genes because you've got the genome sequence. On top of that, of course, you've got your HLA typing as well. So you don't have to then think about, um, you know, is somebody suitable for a bone marrow transplant or whatever else that you might be using that HLA typing for. The information is there. You don't have to go back and do another test. 
um, you've got that information all in one. And, and that goes really for, for everything. There's no need to do multiple tests on these patients to see um, what needs to be done. You've, you've got it all from, from the one sequence, um, um, which I think is fantastic. Just a, a brief mention, um, uh, and I think James mentioned in his little intro, um, uh, working with Invite, but also with Twist Genomics, um, uh, this partnership now, um, uh, Twist Bioscience, um, uh, um, they, they, they make um, pull down panels, um, you know, targeted um, capture panels, and they're working um, hand in hand now with, with PacBio to do these pull downs. So there's various panels that are available. Um, this example here is a pharmacogenomics panel. So again, you can see these um, cytochrome P450 genes um, in the other CYP2. Um, D6 was the one I think it was in the last examples there, along with these other SIPs. Um, so again, these pharmacogenomics panels, so you can pull down your particular regions of interest and sequence, and that gives you the ability to multiplex, of course, and so you get a lot more bang for your buck. You can screen a lot more samples um, with these panels, um, and there's a number of them available, and um, I think there's, there's a lot of future in this for, for, for human, um, uh, human screening. Along with these here, um, uh, of course, you've, we, we've talked a little bit about, um, about rare disease, um, and um, uh, the, as I say, the, 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 the solve rates are, are going up and up and up, which is fantastic news. Um, but the pharmacogenomics I just mentioned, again, 35% um, of patients um, that are on these um, uh, um, drugs, uh, I think they're an antidepressant type of drug, um, uh, they have no effect, and now you can actually start to see why have they got um, um, the, the right genes to to metabolize those those drugs to to have the the, the, the beneficial effects. There's panel for neuroscience, of course. Um, so, ooh, sorry, I keep touching that. Um, uh, Yes, a lot, lots of neurological disorders that you can pull down specifically, of course, cancer and uh, yeah, lot, lots of um, uh, structural variations um, that, that cause cancers um, and uh, yeah, but particularly um, making people at risk of these um, hereditary um, breast and ovarian cancer syndromes. Um, so the BRCA's and things like that. Um, uh, again, there's panels for that. Reproductive health, of course, um, uh, looking at uh, carrier screens for, for, for yeah, um, uh, genes for, for reproductive health. And I mentioned before the HLA, so and very important for transplants, of course, uh, to make sure you've got tissue matching. Um, and uh, this is uh, obviously going to increase solve rates. So, so that's the end for, um, for me. And um, um, I'll stop sharing and, and hand over to James to mention some of the other applications that um, that you can have through through pack by fit sequencing so I, I hope you found that interesting thanks okay great thanks very much Paul um, that's a fantastic intro into uh, what we will tour de force really of what you can do with uh, human whole genome sequencing uh, and also targeted sequencing in that space. And I'm going to just change my pointer. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this um, part of the session is I'm going to talk about some of the other applications um, relevant for human uh, research uh, that perhaps some of them may be well known and others less well known about uh, some of the supported applications that PacBio has uh, in this area. And I'll just reduce that. Uh, it's okay, I'll, I'll hand it. I can just see Paul's video at the top of the screen. Um, so just, but briefly at the start, I'll just do a brief recap of last week. So if you didn't see last week, the, the video is available. And what we covered was um, HiFi uh, microbe applications. In particular, we covered multiplexing of um, small genomes. Uh, so these are uh, microbial whole genome sequencing where we can do 96 samples in one um, smart cell um, in, a, in a very nice uh, supported workflow giving virtually complete genomes. So we talked about that last week and the other area that Paul talked about was uh, the HiFi metagenomics in particular applications around full link 16S sequencing, uh, HiFi metagenome profiling and um, metagenome assembly. Uh, so that was on last week and the video is uh, available. So what I'm going to cover today is uh, the HiFi um, uh, a HiFi viral assay for SARS-CoV-2, uh, some applications in virology, um, 
uh, AAV sequencing and also uh, isoseq as well as uh, uh, epigenomic, um, uh, what we're doing in the epi epigenomics space. So firstly, uh, Hi-Fi um, uh, sequencing of SARS-CoV-2. Now we did release a kit uh, relatively recently towards the end of last year. It's a kitted solution for SARS-CoV-2 uh, sequencing. Um, and, and in fact, PacBio has been um, working with LabCorp for, for quite some time on, SAR, on full whole genome sequencing of um, SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, 10% of the COVID-19 genomes in the US are actually contracted um, or 10% or of them have been sequenced um, using hi-fi reads uh, out of all of the genomes that are contracted by the CDC. Uh, so there's a significant amount of SARS-CoV-2 sequencing uh, on um, PacBio in the US. Uh, and, and so as a uh, outcome of that, uh, PacBio spent some effort on making a, a specific assay for it based around molecular inversion probes uh, and, a, and a kitted solution that goes straight onto the SQL2 with analysis as well. And the basis of that assay is actually molecular inversion probes. They have a particular advantage in that um, they're, they're high specificity. We're using two target sequences uh, where two probes bind um, uh, or, or hybridize to the to the SARS-CoV-2 gene, a genome, and then they do a gap fill, uh, a gap fill to uh, create a copy, uh, and then that molecule then goes in to be sequenced uh, on the SQL2. So we, we end up getting a lot of these uh, or, or these MIP probes that um, uh, get gap filled and then amplified and sequenced on the on the SQL2 system, uh, and the, the density of the probe coverage in our assay is such that every base is covered by roughly 22-fold. Um, coverage uh, at every position in the genome. So we get excellent coverage with these probes um, and that essentially makes the assay resilient to mutation induced dropout, uh, something that is a problematic with amplicon based assays. Um, and it's also more tolerant to sample degradation because we, we can, um, these MIP probes are actually pretty ro robust in handling uh, lower quality samples. Um, so as I said, that, that makes the assay um, more robust uh, and less liable to, to uh, have issues with detecting um, new variants of SARS-CoV-2. And that has been a problem with some of the, some of the other uh, assays, such as the Arctic Primer assays and the Midnight Primer assays, where they've had to update the primers uh, during the course of this SARS-CoV-2 epidemic uh, because they found that the primer sequences um, uh, had, had issues detecting some of the gene regions of some of these variants that popped up uh, where V3 had problems with Delta um, and um, v, V4 had problems with Omicron. And you've seen release, new releases of primer sequences in order to capture the whole genome, which somewhat obviates the purpose of, um, of screening for new variants if your assay is... Um, uh, is, is um, uh, potentially going to have dropouts uh, from uh, when a new variant comes along. Uh, so that's the purpose behind the PacBio assay uh, for um, SARS-CoV-2 is that it, it really has been shown to be pretty robust against uh, new variants. Uh, it also has pretty fast turnaround time, um, good batch sizes uh, and, and relatively cost effective on the SQL 2e. We have also got um, uh, bioinformatics um, uh, tools for the analysis. This gives you an, an idea of sort of the genome coverage on, uh, typically that you would get and you can generate a QC plot showing you the genome coverage that you get for particular uh, samples and the performance QC and this gives you an, uh, just a, an idea of the different um, different uh, coverages of, of samples uh, for the different variants that we've, that we've been seeing um, to show you the consistency of the assay. Uh, and what we do find is, that, and some people that are doing this sequencing will be interested in this, in that the sample uh, sample CT uh, matters, and we and, and anything that's really around that 20, 20 to twenty five CT uh, mark in terms of um, abundance of virus, uh, we can get very high coverage and good coverage with this assay, even out to three hundred eighty four plex, three hundred eighty four uh, samples on one smart cell. So that's the SARS-CoV-2 assay. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, sort of, uh, on still still on the virology theme, is um, some other applications in in virology. Uh, so 
highly accurate long reads are actually really useful for studying all types of viruses because with a highly accurate long read, you can get better resolution of quasi species of viruses in a, pop, in a mixed population in a single infection. So if you imagine if you've got a virus infection uh, and you uh, sequence lots of molecules of that virus uh, with highly accurate long reads, you can get good resolution of quasi species by, by a, being able to amplify up a longer region of the virus, perhaps seeing multiple different SNPs um, that are or variants that are present in, the, in, in different molecules of that virus uh, to then define them as or, or identify them as different uh, quasi species and understand what's happening during an infect, uh, what's happening to virus evolution and, and mutation during an infection. Um, so, you know, that's really useful for lots of different applications in public health and, and uh, in drug resistance, studying immune scape, escape and, and so on. So here's an example of that uh, HIV example where they studied the envelope protein and amplified up the envelope protein, uh, which is a 2.6 KB uh, region of the HIV virus. Um, and this is in a, a, a um, uh, autopsy uh, example where they took samples from lots of different uh, locations in, uh, in this um, uh, cadaver and amplified up the envelope protein region and then did an analysis on, or, or a, essentially a, a, a phylogenetic tree type um, uh, output looking at the relationship of individual molecules of the envelope protein that were sequenced in those, in those different tissues. And they found that um, there, there was definite you know, clonal um, similarity between different um, uh, um, sequences that were sequenced, which, which matched back to the location that they came from, showing that uh, the virus was mutating and uh, generating specific populations, I guess, of, of virus particles that were similar in the different tissues of, the, of, the, of, this, of this human. Um, and interestingly, when they looked at um, uh, the, the, the co-receptor use, uh, so the, 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 where the envelope protein binds to uh, um, a receptor protein for, for entry, they found that, uh, that, that the, the, the virus that was in, present in the brain regions was different to the using a different receptor than the virus that was present in other parts of the body. So you know, these types of things are possible with long read sequencing, being able to uh, do single molecule sequencing and um, uh, I guess haplotyping and, and, and phasing and, and identifying quasi species of viruses. Here's another example um, I'll just briefly mention, which is in influenza infection, where they actually went down to the single cell level and looked at vi what viruses are doing at the actual single cell level. So they looked at 150 infected cells um, from this group, uh, Russell et al. And they found that only 49 were wild type 10 hours post infection. So that the other 100 or so uh, were undergoing um, mutations and they're able to map those mutations, identify deletions, insertions, um, and, and, and which regions of the virus had um, um, multiple variants, variants present uh, across, uh, and this is just a representative sample of 31 of, the, 31 of those cells. Uh, so, so a very nice application in the, in the virus um, 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 field. And there's been lots of, lots of publications where similar types of um, uh, using that, that, that application in, in other types of contexts. And so for, for virus, for virology, it's an, a very nice uh, value proposition for, for highly accurate long reads. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is in gene therapy and AAV vector quality with PacBio HiFi reads. We, we recently uh, released a supported application on the SQL2 system with um, bioinformatics pipeline and um, QC output and reports. Um, so in, in gene therapy, the goal really is, uh, I guess, to introduce a, a, a vector, um, either in vivo, inject a, a vector into an individual to, um, to, to try and disrupt, inactivate or correct or make an insertion into, into a gene. Um, or you take a person's cells and then um, genetically alter them through a, a, some type of a vector and then reintroduce those uh, cells back into the body to try and uh, make that make, make a correction. So there's, there's a, a lot of, this is a huge expanding field um, and lots of different vectors are used to try to deliver DNA um, uh, into a into cells to try and get those edits. Uh, the most common one being AAV it seems to be uh, uh, the most the most common one that we see people using for trying to um, uh, mediate these gene therapy uh, processes, uh, but AAV 
uh, has a bit of a challenge. You know, you, there, there are um, a, a lot of mutations and changes that happen, or, or um, uh, you, you don't always get what you expected. I mean, you expect a full length single stranded DNA inside a capsid cell in order to deliver, deliver something into a, into a cell and make a gene edit. But in reality, you actually get a lot of partially encapsidated or DNA and, and DNA carryover creating um, um, particles that aren't exactly what you expect. And that basically uh, is an issue because it can lead to toxicity and you really know, want to know what you're, what you're producing if you're going down this gene therapy pathway. So the thinking in this field now is that we really need to be analyzing these populations of AAV uh, particles that are being produced uh, in these workflows uh, from a QC perspective and a, and, a, and a validation perspective. Now, the problem is that when you try and validate and sequence your AAV particles, they're really tricky to sequence. You've got uh, inverted terminal repeats, high GC content, palindromic sequences that aren't really amenable to, um, to sequencing very easily. So uh, that just creates problems. Uh, and you, you end up with poor sequence coverage or you don't see the full length vectors. Um, you know, but whereas it's really important to see the full length vectors so you really understand what, what you've got. Uh, so PacBio's uh, turned out to be a really useful technology in, in uh, analyzing these AAV genomes. Um, the, the, the key things being that you can sequence the entire AAV intact molecule to accurately assess your, your vector and um, any cellular impurities. Uh, and it's got a nice easy workflow on the on the uh, on the SQL too. We've actually brought out a, a, a protocol, um, a, a supported protocol, to go from um, AAV DNA through to Smart Bell library construction and sequencing. Um, we, uh, I, I think I have a yes, I have a workflow of this uh, this protocol on the next page. So we go for, uh, from DNA extraction. Uh, we do uh, annealing uh, of the of the of, of DNA and then um, uh, extension to create a, a double stranded DNA, um, and then that double stranded DNA uh, can then have smart bells put on the ends of it, and then just sequenced on the on the system. We run the uh, the, the CCS or the, or the HiFi sequencing, and then do the uh, uh, visual visualization by and bioinformatics. Those of you who are familiar with AAV, I'll just briefly mention that. What you, you get sometimes you get um, um, sometimes you 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 get a, a stem loop I guess on the end of the AAV particle um, and and sometimes not but what what essentially what we're doing is we're just appending smart bell adapters onto the ends of the molecules that we can sometimes you get uh, both ends with a smart bell adapter sometimes only one end. Um, but we can analyze in the bioinformatics and, and detect that and actually do uh, by strand um, uh, analysis of the individual molecules that we're sequencing and understand both the plus strand and the minus strand and, and deconvolute that in the bioinformatics. Um, that's all I'll say about that. It's, it's, uh, this, the, if you're interested in, in a bit more about the workflow, I can talk about it uh, individually. So, um, so with this assay, you know, you can discover new AAV vectors that um, that might provide better targeting to specific tissues. You can optimize your AAV design and create more stable vectors for man, uh, for large scale manufacturing. Um, just a couple of examples here where this application, this this assay, um, uh, was first published by this group, um, Tran et al., and it's essentially somewhat what the PacBio supported workflow is, is based on. But here you can see when they did this full length, they got full length genomes, um, but they also identified uh, with the PAC biosequencing that they were getting truncated genomes um, uh, that had actually, in some cases, parts of the host DNA incorporated um, rather than the full genome. So they really got to understand, you know, what their vectors were doing and, 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 and what sort of uh, contaminations that they, they had so that they could um, they could engineer uh, better, better, better vectors. Um, the same group um, moved on to do um, you know, more larger scale population screening, screening using PacBio, um, and you can see you can you can they actually found that the ITR links, the the uh, inverted terminal repeats on these AAV vectors, um, had a lot of variability in in some cases, um, sometimes the left and right and, and and so on. So they were able to characterize the variability of these uh, AAV regions and the ITR links um, and uh, characterized all of the different types of, um, uh, of, of variants that they found um, uh, within their AAV population. Uh, 
uh, and found that mutated IATRs were, were, were more frequent uh, in producing partial or empty particles. So it seems like the ITR regions are pretty important uh, to, um, uh, or their integrity is important on uh, vector heterogeneity. So that's an application that um, we, we have on the PacBio system now. So you can comprehensively profile packaged AAV genomes. Um, and obviously it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's, an, it's an important one and gene therapy is an important area. Okay, so the, uh, the next um, application I'm gonna talk about is uh, epigenomics. Um, now, Paul touched on the fact that the, 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 the rate of base incorporation or what we call the kinetics of base incorporation can be used actually to infer uh, epigenetic modifications. Uh, some of you may be, may be aware of that. And that's really important um, in the, because uh, epigenetic modifications such as 5MC have important biological functions such as silencing DNA elements, um, maintaining cell identity, uh, and it's involved in X inactivation to compensate dosage in, in, in females. So there's a lot of interest in studying 5MC uh, at CPG sites in, in human genomes. Uh, now, the way that we, we do this, or the way that we study methylation in, in, uh, in, um, uh, with PacBio is we use native DNA that has the methylation marks on it. Um, and as I mentioned, the base, if you imagine that this is us calling bases as we sequence through a molecule, um, uh, uh, if you encounter a, a methyl base, it, it usually, it has an impact on how, how fast the next base is incorporated. It usually slows it down. Uh, and that usually has an imprint across about 20 uh, or so base pairs. Um, and so it's that, it's that time difference from base incorporation that we use that information to infer that there is a methylation group present at that site. Um, now, some of you may be aware that, uh, uh, that, that you know, PacBio has been able to do bacterial methylation very, very easily. And that's because um, bacteria have different types of methylation. 6MA is, a, is, a, is, a, is an example of that. And they have really strong signals. It really sort of slows down the polymerase. Um, and you can see that in, the, um, in these interpulse duration ratios, these measures of the, of the rate of base incorporation. Whereas 5MC has a more sort of diffuse signal. And you look at the, the scale on these charts, it's, uh, this is actually a much more subtle signature than 6MA. So we've had challenges in detecting 5MC in the past. Um, but now with HiFi, we have, um, uh, in the same way that Paul explained, that you get multiple observations of a sequence to produce an accurate read. We now get multiple observations of kinetics to produce accurate methylation uh, information from, um, uh, from, a, from a molecule. Uh, so, so now the algorithms uh, have recently been become a bit more mature there. And we've actually implemented it as a standard thing on our SQL2 system is that we have methylation calling, 5MC calling in CP, at CPG sites on instrument and, it's in, and the analysis of it is implemented in, in our uh, latest um, software update for the, for the SQL2E system. So that's really interesting because now you can get, not only can you get obviously variant information and SVs and all of that type of thing, but you can now produce heat maps of um, methylated versus unmethylated uh, sites uh, on your hi-fi reads uh, where, the, where the, I guess the, the strength of the color here uh, gives you an, an idea of the, the, uh, the strength of uh, the, the um, uh, certainty of whether it's methylated or not based on the algorithms that we're using to detect that methylation and look at the kinetics. Uh, so really nice um, um, ap uh, application, which can be uh, applied to lots of different contexts. This is just one example in Prader-Willi syndrome, uh, where we can look at um, uh, we can look at um, uh, paternal and maternal imprinting of methylation uh, and separate uh, and, and phase the methylation onto separate alleles, leveraging the fact that we have the methylation data and the um, single nucleotide variant data to be able to phase the sequences and stratify the sequences into into the um, um, mother and father uh, uh, um, alleles. Um, and in, in this example, we can see in, in the controls uh, that, that, that don't have this syndrome, uh, you get the paternal allele unmethylated, whereas the maternal allele is methylated, but in Prader-Willi sy syndrome, both alleles, the maternal, um, both alleles are shown to be in the, the maternal alleles and they're both uh, methylated. Um, so really nice application of um, how methylation um, how we how we can use that 5MC uh, application. 
So now the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, the RNA isoform landscape and our, and our isoseq assay. Uh, it's um, uh, something we've been doing for a long time, but obviously with HiFi, our accuracy has improved and we can do some interesting things with, um, with isoforms. Now, alternative, uh, um, uh, RNA isoforms are, are, are important to study. Um, alternative splicing is, is, is fundamental in producing diversity of proteins in the body. Um, you can imagine you have a gene and, and you've got uh, all, all these possible exons across this gene with, uh, with, with introns in between. Um, and this gene, as it's produced, produces an mRNA transcript. That mRNA transcript can uh, matures and then gets um, different exons can be spliced together in different combinations to produce uh, uh, different proteins. So around 95% of genes actually undergo alternately alternative splicing and produce more than one protein. Uh, and in fact, cells express around four isoforms uh, per gene. So there's a lot of complexity in the, in the, in the proteins that are produced from a, from a single gene um, from the, the, the mechanism of alternative splicing and the production of different mRNA isoforms. isoforms. Um, and that can be important, particularly in, 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 in cancer, as it turns out, um, where one isoform um, can, uh, in, in this particular example, uh, this BCLX protein has two isoforms and this short isoform is expressed in normal cells, whereas this long isoform, this uh, BCLXL mRNA uh, long isoform is overexpressed in cancer cells and actually promotes cancer progression and resistance to chemotherapy. So if you're not looking at the full transcript, um, you're missing that information and, and, and um, potentially, um, uh, you know, it's, it's useful to, to understand what isoforms present. So to give you an idea of uh, uh, cancer progression or um, uh, response to cancer. Um, so uh, there's a lot of interest in this, in this area and, and, and quite a number of outcomes. There's an, uh, some examples shown here in different uh, cancers where different isoforms have found to be related to prognosis and driving um, either uh, um, and, and, and helping predict uh, the response to therapy, uh, which, which uh, you know, can be used as really useful biomarkers uh, for cancer progression and, and prognosis and also, um, also uh, predictors of, of which drugs might be, might be uh, effective or not. Um, and, and also, um, you know, different isoforms and, and proteins can be uh, potentially identified as neoantigens uh, and therefore targets for immuno-oncology. Um, but the problem is the vast majority of cancer-specific isoforms, they, they actually remain unknown. And it's only now that we're starting to do this full-length cDNA sequencing that we really get an, an, an idea of it. And that's because Isoform studies in the past have mainly been uh, geared around short read sequencing and short read sequencing in order to uh, infer isoforms, what short read sequencing does is it, it, it looks for the sequences that may be over the junctions of uh, two uh, exons um, and then infers that, okay, well, those exons were joined together somewhere along the line. And so therefore we can sort of predict possibly what the full length um, uh, isoform might be. Um, but in actual fact, that's a really difficult bioinformatic problem when you're only looking at single exon exon junctions. And you can only assemble about, um, or in most cases, only assemble about 20 to 40% of, of the actual transcriptome by using this type of, of approach. Whereas with a full length uh, cDNA sequencing with HiFi, with PacBio, you, 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 you sequence the entire transcript. There's no ambiguity, and you uh, absolutely see what isoform is, is present. Um, even even if it's at low low frequency, which which many of them are, uh, so this so the PAC bio system offers you the, the, the you know, superior isoform discovery power, and you get a complete view of isoforms. And because the sequences are highly accurate, um, you can also see um, things like allele specific expression uh, and SNPs and variants that might be present in in cancer. So that having those highly accurate reads is also a really key component of doing um, high high quality um, isoform discovery. Um, our isoform, our isoseq method, we call it isoseq, this uh, sequencing of full length cDNA uh, molecules uh, is an end to end solution. It's a, it's a one day library prep, one day sequencing and less than a day's analysis. Uh, and we have plenty of resources on best practices and protocols for, for running this, this, this assay. 
So what do you get from uh, one smart cell of isoseq data? Um, this gives you an example. We uh, typically get, um, uh, this is actually, um, I would say probably on the, on the higher end, this is a nice example, but I'll show you a nice example where we get uh, in these two examples, um, over 4 million full length reads from one smart cell, um, uh, identifying around, uh, you know, close to 20,000 unique genes. Um, and within those genes, uh, close to about 200,000 unique transcripts um, just from one smart cell of data. So uh, with the SQL 2E system, we get, um, we actually get, we get quite, quite a bit of, uh, of data and I'll talk later on about how we're actually trying to boost that up significantly. Um, so what can you do with isoseq data? Um, key applications are in genome annotation. I talked about isoform discovery already and I'll give you some, some more examples. Um, differential analysis of uh, different isoforms and also a, a, a huge area at the moment is in the in the single cell transcriptomics and it's an area that I, I think uh, is, is pretty exciting for full length um, cDNA sequencing. Uh, so for example in genome annotation and typical genome annotation experiment you do uh, uh, probably one smart cell uh, of sequencing is, is enough and you can multiplex up to 12 tissues in that. This is fully supported in our smart link analysis. There's, as I said earlier, no assembly required, and you can get high quality genome annotation from just one smart cell of data. Um, and that'll allow you to correct previous annotation areas and, and, and validate gene models. Uh, here's an example of this where we've used, uh, I, uh, this, this group have used um, isoseq to uh, annotate um, Arabidopsis and uh, in, in, will improve the existing annotations by doing uh, full length cDNA sequencing uh, and, and identifying um, uh, a whole host of new, um, new uh, isoforms that were previously unannotated. Uh, another example of uh, a center for uh, creature uh, where they uh, did a, a, a genome assembly and, iso and used isoseq to annotate 13, 000, uh, almost all of, the, all of the genes and found um, 619 predicted species specific proteins um, and, and things like nested uh, intronic genes. Um, when I looked at this and, and studied it, I read the paper, I thought, what the, what, what, what is a, a center for? So I, I looked it up and it actually turns out to be um, a, a sea creature, which, um, uh, which is um, quite, quite <laughs> looks quite spectacular. I'm not sort of sure what sort of light conditions these are, but um, yeah, it's a sea creature, uh, which I think they call a, um, I can't remember the common name now, but um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting creature. Um, so in isoform discovery, I talk, already talked a little bit about that. Um, for isoform discovery, typically you can do some very nice novel isoform discovery with one smart cell of data, um, and that'll allow you to characterize novel splice isoforms, identify a little specific uh, isoforms and predict and validate protein isoforms. Here's an example of this in uh, a gastric uh, cancer example where they've um, uh, discovered new, new isoforms and identified um, uh, the, the, these isoforms that, had, that were truncated, um, had a truncated protein with a different start site uh, where this, this novel promoter was driving, um, uh, was, 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 was driving the expression of uh, an, an isoform that, that missed the first exon. Um, and they found that this was actually pretty important in, because this novel, um, novel promoter that was driving this different isoform was, um, uh, was associated with poor survival outcomes, as you, as you can see here. Um, so, you know, again, that can be used as, as a biomarker and perhaps, um, perhaps as, a, as a target. And another example, very nice example here is in, in breast cancer, where they actually did a, 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 essentially an atlas of breast cancer Transcript, uh, transcriptomics using uh, full length um, PAC bio cDNA sequencing, uh, where they took uh, a whole lot of different uh, tumor samples and a, and a whole lot of normal samples and did uh, isoform discovery using long and short read and classified those, uh, did isoform classification. And they found that actually two thirds of the isoforms they identified were novel. So <laughs> vast majority of the isoforms were, were, were novel and, um, and, and, and not annotated in, in, in databases. And they found that there was two times more of these novel isoforms in clinical versus normal, normal samples. So, um, you know, a, a wealth of resources to, to, to study and trying to what's happening in, in these, in these um, uh, 
in, in breast cancer. And in, interestingly, what they found, this is the same work, they found that uh, many of those uh, new isoforms, those novel isoforms, uh, were present in uh, oncogenes. So he, here's a, a, a list of the oncogenes that were represented in this experiment, uh, in this study. Uh, and they found that many of these oncogenes had um, lots of you know, novel isoforms that were present. Um, and so you can see here, uh, you know, these are all the novel isoforms that, that, that they found in this particular gene, just as an example, uh, that weren't categorized before. And when you look at, you know, what are, what's, the, what's the effect of this, that many of these isoforms had um, important, you know, impacts on important functional domains, um, and uh, many of them affected conserved domain, domains or, or domains that had protein localization effects. So probably leading to some type of, of functional outcome. So um, it's it's uh, you know really important to be to be looking at that that full length to really understand um, more of the biology. Um, and, and leading on this in the in the same study, they actually found that many of these. Um, uh, many of these isoforms actually were associated with survival prognosis. So you can see all these uh, isoforms that they're studying here. And in this column here, um, survival prognosis was um, uh, you know, either classified as unfavorable or favorable here, to, and, and they could associate that with the isoforms that were present. So there's a wealth of, of biomarkers that, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, in, in diagnosis to to understand, I guess, what the prognosis of a patient would be, as well as in in you know, the translational research space, that perhaps these are you know is a rich set of targets for um, uh, essentially neoantigens for immuno perhaps immuno oncology approaches to, uh, to to treat this cancer. So, really nice study showing uh, the power of uh, full link cDNA sequencing. Um, now, the final thing that I'm going to mention here is um, in single cell. Uh, transcriptomics. Uh, so in single cell trans transcriptomics, um, typically one smart cell of uh, uh, one smart cell of data is gives you a, a nice data set to, to give full length isoforms and, and you can uh, either decide to match it or not match it with, uh, with uh, short read data um, to be able to identify cell type specific isoforms and identify mutations within transcripts. Um, so, so typically with single cell transcriptomics, most of the uh, assays um, only interrogate the three prime or the five prime end of the transcript. You miss all of the rest of the transcript and, and what, what isoforms are present with most of the um, commonly used commercial uh, assays. Um, but it is possible to plug into those, um, into those uh, assays uh, long read sequencing with, with most of them. For example, for 10x genomics, the first thing that happens when you see when you're um, uh, when you're processing your cells is that full length cDNA comes out of the system, and then that full length cDNA is typically uh, chopped up and turned into a library for sequencing the three prime end of the transcript. But you can take that full length cDNA and actually sequence it on the PacBio system and get um, uh, full length. Um, uh, iso, uh, full length uh, cDNA sequencing to, to, to identify mRNA isoforms that are present at the single cell level. Um, so there's a, quite a number of publications now in that space um, and you know, doing that on PacBio is really, uh, uh, really nice because you can read the 10X barcodes, you can read the UMIs and you can also identify individual variants that might be present on uh, uh, present within within transcripts and potentially also look at allele specific expression. Uh, so this is an example in, 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 in brain, I believe this is uh, out of the Tildner lab, where uh, they've uh, just a, a snapshot of some of the genes that they looked at, four different genes here, um, where they looked in, um, uh, where, they where they identified uh, different, iso uh, different levels of different isoforms in different regions of, in different regions of the brain. Uh, so, so it gives them a number of targets to follow up to identify, you know, why is one isoform more abundant in this particular region of the brain for this gene compared to another region uh, of, of the brain. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, it's an expanding field we're looking at um, uh, full length um, uh, transcripts in the single cell space. Um, and, but one of the, I guess, one of the limitations previously with PAC, doing this on PacBio is that single cell transcriptomics generally needs a very large amount of data. 
Um, and I mentioned earlier that we typically get about 4 million reads from one smart, one 8M smart cell uh, on the SQL 2 system. So what we've done, actually, well, well, what some of our customers have done and researchers have done, and this has come out of the Broad, is they've divide, designed a really neat assay and, and, they, and they've taken, the, uh, taken this from the, the or, or you, can, you can think about hi-fi sequencing general, in general, and I think Paul mentioned this earlier, that we can do this on 20 KB molecules but your typical cDNA is only about 1.5 to 2 kV long. Um, so what, what these, this group at the Broad did is worked out a way to concatenate lots of cDNAs together into one uh, uh, longer molecule uh, by using a, a, a nice, neat protocol for programmable concatenation uh, such that they pr produced a molecule that had uh, uh, 10, either uh, 10, 10, I think they looked at 15 different molecules, uh, all concatenated in, um, in, in one molecule. And then when you sequence that on the system, uh, you still get 4 million ZMWs of data, but each sequence, of, uh, each sequence uh, that comes back is actually 10 cDNA molecules. And then you can demultiplex that data and essentially get 30 million individual data points of uh, cDNA from one 8M smart cell leading, which is represents a 10 to 15 fold increase in throughput of the SQL2 platform for, um, uh, for transcriptomics. Now we are actually looking to uh, bring that out as a kitted solution uh, at some point this year, uh, where you'll be able to take your full link cDNA coming off your 10X genomics um, system um, and go through this concatenation protocol to produce very large amounts of data from one smart cell on the PacBio system. So that's going to be pretty, um, pretty exciting, I think. And uh, we've already, uh, out of this publication, they showed that th uh, around that 30 million reads mark from one smart cell is enough to be able to do very nice cell clustering, um, which is almost equivalent to uh, 80 million reads of short reads. Uh, but with this data, you can then overlay uh, on your cell clusters um, the different alternative splices of different um, uh, or different uh, isoforms of different genes to show and, and in this particular example they showed that CD45 was expressed um, different isoforms of CD45 were expressed at different uh, levels in different um, subpopulations of cells so I think that this is just going to be a, a pretty exciting area to get into in an exploding field of looking at this uh, um, uh, single cell specific isoform expression. Now with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up. I've, uh, just a, a summary, I guess, of, of, of what I've just talked about in this section, uh, a whole bunch of applications, uh, most of which are, are now supported on SQL 2E. Um, and we'd uh, love to talk to you more about anything that you um, may be particularly interested in. So I'll stop there and I think we'll take some questions uh, if there's any questions in the chat. Thanks, James. There's there's nothing that I can see in the chat, right? But um, that was great. Thank you. Um, I just have a question about the ISOSeq. So it can identify the um, the isoforms, um, and I guess you can characterize that. Um, does it give you the expression data as well? So you can do like differential expression analysis. Um, look, that's a great question, and I think we don't have enough data to really answer that question. Um, it's it, it it could it's probably possible with genes that are at higher levels of expression to be able to do differential expression analysis. Um, in fact, I think I think it probably will be, um, but I think the, the the jury's out on that. Certainly, with the previous assay, where one smart cell of data producing three to four million data points wasn't really enough to do yeah. differential gene expression analysis, uh, but with ten to fifteen fold times more data, um, I think, um, and and I'll I really would have to I'd prefer that like our bioinformaticians to answer this question, um, but I think that it is uh, quite probably quite possible to do gene level uh, expression analysis. But isoform specific uh, differential expression analysis might only be possible if you've got um, um, if you've got highly expressed genes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the library prep, it's like a is a poly A capture, so it's capturing all mRNAs. So you should get differential expression of you know all at the gene level, as you said. Um, but then if you want to dig deeper and look at 
this isoforms, then you'd need probably even more reads, maybe. I, as I said, I think uh, I think we don't have enough data to really yeah. understand that, and the bioinformatics um, pipelines probably will undergo some level of improvement as well to perhaps be able to pr provide that data. Um, certainly, you know, you have your UMIs, and you'd be able to uh, collapse them um, and get some level of um, quantitation. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, 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 it's hard for me to. Oh. say how much you can do differential gene expression i don't want to say yeah you can do that across the whole data set um, yep. but i suspect you'll be able to do it across um, a portion of the data set the the other way um that the other thing we're looking at doing as well uh or, or actually it's already been done by a number of customers of ours is to is to enrich for particular genes um, by using for example the twist um probe uh, pull down baits to uh, look at panels of genes of interest out of um, single cell data for example so that um, hasn't been done a lot yet but it's certainly uh, starting to be done and i think that that will probably help you target or if you're interested in particular genes differential expression of different genes enriching for those genes and getting more data on those particular genes and, and mm -hmm. referencing back to the umis will will we'll probably be able to give you uh, good information about differential expression and also for, I guess, the single cell. So the 10X, you said like you can use the libraries from the 10X uh, nuclei or, or uh, fresh cells? Uh, well, well, either actually, yeah. And you can, um, because it's it's just a double-stranded DNA molecule that comes off the 10X system. We're, we're leveraging the, 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 the known sequences that are on the ends of those cDNAs. Um, and, 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 and for 10X, for example, they use uh, oligo-DT um, to uh, bind to the poly A tail and then produce a full length cDNA molecule from, from that. So that's targeting um, polyadenylated uh, mRNA. Um, and that 10X assay we know works in um, uh, nuclei as well as whole cells. And so you can analyze that with PacBio. Um, you obviously you'll lose some of the isoform data in nuclei because you've got pre-processed RNA at that point. But um, but yeah, this the principle of yeah. capturing everything is still applies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there are um, there are also um, ideas such as using um, uh, bait probe probe pull down of of um, uh, mRNAs that have undergone splicing. So from a nuclei. Uh, there are potentially ways that you can enrich for spliced isoforms out of nuclei so that you get more data on the spliced isoforms rather than the pre-mRNAs uh, by using a probe, uh, probe pull-down method, perhaps against the entire uh, exome. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know that that's being uh, looked at as well. Yeah. Okay. Good questions, Joey. Thanks. Thanks. Um, anyone else? I think we're at the end right um yeah so i guess if there's no one else thank you guys um yeah if if you anyone wants to reach out and find more just let me know and i can put you in touch with um james and paul thanks joey and thanks david um coming up as karen there but thanks david for hosting this from doing millennium science so cheers yeah thanks david and Hopefully, Joey, we can uh, in the not too distant future at some point come up and visit you in person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm happy think to talk to anyone uh, up there if they've got specific applications they want to deep dive into. Yeah, now our institute has opened up a bit more. So we we are less restricted than you know when we started talking about this event. So it should be easier. Yeah. Okay. Right. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.